carbon dioxide is causing all of these huge problems in the, in the world, that carbon dioxide is a pollutant. Uh, you know, carbon dioxide is a component in the atmosphere. Uh, and everything you can say about carbon dioxide, you can also say about oxygen. So is oxygen a pollutant? Is water a pollutant? But CO2 is a necessary component of all plants. Plants get their nitrogen, their phosphorus, their, their other important elements for growth and development from the soil. But the one thing they don't get from the soil is CO2. And that CO2 is converted by photosynthesis in the plant into sugars. And those sugars then drive all of the metabolic processes that go to cause a plant to develop into whatever the, the genetic makeup of the plant tells it to do. And so CO2 in our atmosphere is not a pollutant, it's a necessary component for the survival of all plants and ultimately mankind. Man has always enjoyed a special relationship with plants as a necessary component of our dietary and biological welfare. Plants and humans share a unique exchange of life as we necessarily breathe together, each inhaling while the other exhales. Yeah, let's remember uh, the next time uh, you're, you're out with your friend, tell him to stop breathing and it, it helped the planet because uh, that's what he outbreathes is CO2. CO2 is not bad. It turns out that uh, the plants love CO2. If you, all the experiments show if you, uh, in a greenhouse where you grow plants and trees and bushes, you know, if you increase the CO2, they grow faster. So, you know, it's not bad. I mean, I get a, a big kick every time when it, they talk about CO2 being a poison. It's really not poison, you know. It's it's really good for the planet. Uh, makes makes things grow. Elevated CO2 levels uh, for plants would be a very great thing. They would love that. Yeah, all the studies, every study that's ever been done where they have taken a greenhouse such as this and injected elevated levels of CO2 into this greenhouse, the plants grow faster, they, they, they uh, are much more robust, uh, and one can readily find that uh, example on the internet. carbon dioxide, threatens public Curve health, and the environment. The EPA was given uh, permission or a regulatory power to determine what things are pollutants, and one of them they declared a pollutant, of course, was carbon dioxide, which carbon dioxide from humans is just a teeny tiny minuscule, you know, one twelfth of one percent of the total carbon dioxide that's considered a pollutant, if you will. But it's really one of the building blocks of life. It's required for crops to grow. It's required for you know trees to repopulate so that our reforestation can take place. To consider it a pollutant is ridiculous. That's correct, yes. It's a building block of life. CO2, good for you. CO2 has some overwhelmingly positive effects on our environment. To consider CO2 a pollutant is blatantly short-sighted. It's the same idea as labeling water as a pollutant, just because too much of it can drown someone. So what is the broader relationship between CO2 and temperature? And perhaps more importantly, how have they interacted throughout the past, before the human industrial machine? In order to understand the present day climate, we need to know how the climate has behaved in the past. And in order to 
predict where we are heading, we need to know where we have been. Let's take a step back, beyond global cooling, much further back, flying through time deep into the past, before oh, okay. human influence, before the first carbon footprint of man was cast into the earth. Well, the carbon dioxide rise follows the temperature rise by anywhere from 300 to 800 years. You have to warm up the temperatures first. What that does, it melts the ice winds of the oceans and it reintroduces stored carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. This is a natural process. Earth's temperature cooling and warming. And the Earth has gone through this for eons. You can see it in the ice cores. Al Gore's movie, for example, tries to show you that, ah, look at this, CO2 is going up and the temperature goes up. The CO2 goes down and the temperature goes down. Uh, what he fails to tell you that is in the real ice cores taken from all over the globe, that the CO2 levels follow the temperature levels by around 800 years. So the temperature may go up and the CO2 will go up behind it. The temperatures begin to go down, the CO2 then follows behind it. And it's like this. That's what all the ice cores are showing. And that follows what we know very well. Once we have taken our first step from the present into the past, we begin to recognize a contradictory trend that CO2 levels have followed temperature levels by 300 to 800 years. After temperature plummets, CO2 levels remain high for as long as 10 to 30,000 years. Once the temperatures fall down off the global, global warming mega cycle, the 116,000 year cycle, and falls for about 30,000 years to 40,000 years, like a rock, the temperature will fall. The carbon dioxide stays up high for 10, 20, 30,000 years even. If carbon dioxide temperatures could not fall, the temperatures would be continuing to rise or at least stay the same. So if the temperatures cause the carbon dioxide and vice versa, we would never get out of global warming. We'd have runaway global warming. We would have had runaway global warming 50 million years ago. And it'd be like taking the Earth and placing the Earth right next to the sun and just baking us. The reality is climate always changes, and the more we look at the history of climate, we see periods in the past that quite naturally were about as warm as where we are today. So global warming today is looking less and less unprecedented and less and less scary. Historically, uh, does this fit with past history? Better, worse, what have you? Uh, I see, I find nothing outstanding about it. Because at about four to 6,000 years ago, Things warmed up sufficiently that people began experimenting and they um, created metal tools for the first time and apparently they thrived. One of the interesting things in Europe going on right now is that as the glaciers retreat, what are we uncovering? Bronze Age villages that are where the mouth of the glacier was at that period of time. So obviously we've been at least as warm before as we are now. And um, you know, the end of a glacier was a good place to live when you were in the Bronze Age, because you always had fresh water. To put it even more concrete, I hope the audience know that uh, about a thousand years ago, we do have a period known as the medieval warm period. This is a very, very well-known and recorded history, actually, right? In, in many places. The most well-known places is actually Greenland. Notice the word Greenland. I mean, Greenland. It was green then, you know, a thousand years ago. I mean, essentially, even with all the modern technology and modern conveniences, right, that we have now, it, you couldn't say that we can try to farm things there. You know, you don't want to have a strawberry farm, whatever, cultivating in Greenland right now. You know, that just tell you that a thousand years ago, it must have been warmer than what Greenland is today. That's basically what the whole idea is. If you went across the Atlantic to Greenland, southwest of Greenland at that time, at Valse, which was the principal 
Viking settlement in southwestern Greenland, there was a very substantial Viking population, and of course they had to bury their dead. And if you go to the graveyard there now, you'll find it is under permafrost. It certainly wasn't under permafrost at the time when they were buried, and those medieval tools were not capable of cutting through it. So for these reasons, we know that the Middle Ages were warmer, certainly in Europe and North America, and arguably worldwide, than they are now, and warmer by quite a bit. You look at England, for example, during the medieval warm period, they were growing grapes in England. Those are non-existent right now because the temperatures have been too cool. And if you go also to northern France, where they certainly can't grow wine today, and you go to the cathedral of Amiens, and you look in one of the stained glass windows there, you will see pictures of the various local industries of the time, including uh, a clear picture of vineyards where they were growing and collecting grapes. Anyway, there are all sorts of reports, you know, reports of Deep seals disappearing ahead. because the ice is gone, and, and you look at these reports, it sounds like something, again, you would read from Jim Hansen or Al Gore, and yet it's dated 1923, 1843, 1880, or, you know, pick some random year in the past. And I'm sure the Vikings could have written some real nice ones about a thousand years ago when they were sailing up to Greenland and settling and raising barley and making beer. You don't see Vikings making beer in Greenland now. Imported from Denmark. Too hard. Greenland, which today is covered in ice, was once a fertile island, better suited to agriculture with more abundant plant life throughout the region. The weather was so moderate during the medieval warm period that Vikings grew barley and made beer while northern wineries in France grew wine throughout regions that are today unfit for these segments of agriculture. Throughout history, if you look at the cycles of warming and cooling, during warming periods, it, we actually thrive as a human race. Those are periods of actually much more mild weather patterns, and our plants and forests tend to grow better, and so we have more food to feed hungry people. It's, it's not something you need to fix. It's something you need to be aware of and maybe learn to adapt and capitalize on those warming periods when they come about. Well, the climate is changing. There's no doubt about that. Every reputable scientist agrees with it. But uh, the term skeptic is in relation to anthropogenic climate change, which you know supports that carbon dioxide is changing the planet. It's simply not. To be serious, this carbon dioxide thing is, I don't know, I like to create the phrase also carbon dioxide monster. It is that kind of thing like, a, you know, children fictional story, you know, this monster, you know, it's just very artificial stuff that, you know, has nothing to do with reality. You know, carbon dioxide, after all, is, uh, I would like to say, is food for plants and marine life. We know that the plants love carbon dioxide. And these folks are actually telling us that we need to pay money to cut down the carbon dioxide. As we return to the present, we can observe that the Earth's temperature has always been in flux, endlessly cooling and warming. It is only recently, however, that carbon dioxide has been heralded as the monster who will incinerate the planet if left unregulated. When relying on the science of international bodies to prove global warming exists, the problem then becomes what to do about it, and regulatory political groups are seemingly all too happy to show you what they think you Stop should on, do you got a potential person masquerading as a police officer at 24 in the middle looking at you. A wolf, a wolf, we've seen it too. With your hands in your pockets, each client, I know what to do. Just as the EPA is the federal body representing climate regulations in the United States, Internationally, the United Nations is attempting to monitor and regulate CO2 through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The IPCC is widely credited as the foremost authority on climate change throughout the world. Well, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I think the key word is intergovernmental, uh, the participants are chosen by political branches of member governments. Most 
the participants are scientists, many are not, and we see a lot of bias in the selection process because these are the political branches of, of governments making the choices. The whole idea of the IPCC is, is a good one in concept. Let's objectively look at what's happened and objectively look at what could occur. The problem, however, is yeah, that, ahead, that men men made, up there, uh, stated that there was something like a man-made global warming problem. And, uh, well, they are focusing on proving that this is true. Which is oh, not oh, true. Oh, 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 it's just trying to prove what has been in the mandate, which was given by them by the politicians. Either way, he ain't got his brakes. I guess he don't know how to use a jig brake. Well, it's supposed to be objective. The author of that is just not We hear a lot about the 2,600 scientists, the unified position of 2,600 scientists. I guess nobody the taught us that overusing your brakes actually makes you more in danger than just coasting down the hill. Many do not agree with the final I didn't know if he just didn't know how to drive his wagon in the hall over here. So he has 51 miles an hour or what? and calculated predictions about the climate every well, the speed limit for the curve is 55 to the be there, but yeah, he just published in 1990. way, way, way over the flash brakes and way too often. Was published in I, uh, well, I do it four times a week at around 70. If I give you a dumbass ride on my way, the curve is not that fast. Uh, I think you can put it up there for stupid people who have to go to school and get driving like A couple of weeks ago, we had a public hearing. Well, maybe the state just puts that because for the worst case, um, it should be done at 55. And, um, and regardless of how somebody learns to drive, to me, and um, they that's their right to do that. You know, you know that's, with the if that's, they feel that they makes them safe, that's comments. their right to do that. And, and they're I said, well, complying with the law. Matter of fact, I don't know what they did with my comments. I know law is that you got a right to be fine with the suggestion. If it was a law, it'd be out of white time. Now correct me if I'm wrong, the way I learned, any rectangular sign is a regulatory sign, and color was not the thing. Very serious way. Maybe in this case, but not in North Carolina. Despite the statements of That's where Pachari, I'm from. Pachauri always said, Well, well you're wrong, because not North Carolina. North Carolina, uh, 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 North Carolina. Uh, and uh, uh, the reactions to the comments of the uh, expert reviewers I look that are when I get back very carefully considered. And the reality is that there is no communication about the comments of the climate skeptics. So, in fact, uh, what... Um, so either way, he's following a suggestion. That's that's pretty much a good thing. I mean, really. Doesn't simply match reality. Despite the IPCC attempts to force their mandate, there is no unified position. I think they should teach people how to read curves and drivers that you know, instead of just relying on. Because I know many, many places where I've gone far above the suggested speed limit too. And um, find their works sometimes you really should, man. Words. And sometimes there's curves out here that well, in the IPCC, aren't labeled that, that should be. It's all good, man. Just just take it for what it is, you know. And relax. You don't have to get there yesterday. Concerns of the IPCC's leadership are ignored. Some scientists, like three-time expert reviewer Christopher Lancy, choose to not sit by quietly. And so my contributions in both 1995 and 2000 were to provide a hurricane section on how hurricanes have changed. Uh, and I was asked in 2004 to provide that uh, again for the most recent IPCC assessment. Uh, and the person that asked me was uh, Kevin Trenworth, who was the lead author for the chapter on observations. And it turned out 2004 was 
another very, very nasty hurricane season. With four hurricanes hitting Florida, unprecedented damage we were seeing, and there was a lot of speculation about what was causing the hurricanes. And I was um, distressed to find out in, in late 2004 that Kevin was going to participate in a press conference at Harvard to link hurricanes to global warming. The reason that was a concern to me was, was multifold. Well, first, he never published anything on hurricanes. Nothing. And he wasn't talking about any new peer-reviewed science. And, and third, he was introduced and uh, as being the IPCC lead author. So it was appearing to be an IPCC condoned or, or related event when it had nothing to do with the IPCC. It should not. Now, I found out about the press conference the day before it happened, and I expressed my concerns about it to Kevin directly, and uh, he brushed aside my concerns. Uh, and after the press conference occurred, then I told the folks at the IPCC leadership, including uh, uh, Susan Solomon and the IPCC chair as well, and uh, about the inappropriateness. So my concerns were tossed aside, by the IPCC leadership, so I resigned from the IPCC process. Dear colleagues, after some prolonged deliberation, I have decided to withdraw from participating in the fourth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. I am withdrawing because I have come to view the part of the IPCC in which my expertise is relevant. It's having a Shepherds of global warming fabricated or grossly exaggerated. We've seen revelations of errors of fact and forecasting in the IPCC reports. We've seen the collapse of international negotiations in Copenhagen. Um, just over the last few months, we've had the revelations from ClimateGate uh, revealing a very disturbing pattern of the suppression of academic debate on this topic. Uh, Gallup has been tracking public opinion on global warming for some time. Uh, and when they first started tracking it, I think about 28% of the people said, would agree with the following statement. Global warming is real but exaggerated. Now 48%... Boy, down there, down the going back down the way, down. probably had something to do with that. Oh, 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 the climate gate uh, is a very important development because it reveals what many scientists and analysts have suspected. No, it wouldn't be up to me. I ain't done nothing wrong in my truck because almost brand new. Are you still up behind me, person? Talk about that white pickup truck. I got my big car in there. I think he was in there. I was playing back there. That white pickup truck is a hunter. Hunter, person who kills animals for farm profit and meat.
stick graph is touted as the key piece of evidence and used to support the hypothesis made by the shepherds of global warming. This graph shows high temperatures spiking in the modern era. When placed next to a Yeah, there the would be no reason to become up to me. I got brand new tires, brand new brakes, my truck's clean, dashboard's clean. Thus proving that CO2 um, just like a professional Chugs clean in the inside. Correlation yeah. Just Highly doubtful. Yeah, there's all sorts of hockey sticks. But basically a hockey stick is where you can process the data so it's tooling along nice and happily.
charge credits to industries right now to release carbon dioxide, power companies, industry, heavy, heavy industries, etc. Or they may instead make those credits available for auction. But regardless, what this would entail is there would only be a certain amount of carbon dioxide and in order to Steve downgrade to ahead. carbon dioxide at all, you would need a permit to do so. Essentially, it's going to be a tax. It's going to be a tax on CO2. And it's, it's an incredible way to generate a tremendous amount of revenue. And the great fear in Washington, D.C., among people like me, freedom lovers, is that once the members of Congress get the taste of this tax, they'll never let it go because it'll be money to burn, money that they can spend. Cap and trade carries a considerable right amount of ahead. cost to companies right who ahead. emit CO2. Through the ever-increasing standards of this legislation, companies are forced to pay for expensive permits which allow them to emit CO2 through their businesses. This cost will be passed to the consumer through the increase in the price of energy. Energy is the single most important factor to the economic well-being of the U.S. economy. Cheap energy has made America what it is today synonymous with the high quality of life. Through the past and the present, whenever energy becomes expensive, there are serious economic repercussions. As we've observed, this cost will be passed to the consumer through the increased price of goods, which poses the question, what ramifications will cap and trade have on the economy today? Any efforts to restrict carbon dioxide would be catastrophic to our economy. As I mentioned earlier, President Barack Obama said that cap and trade would necessarily cause electricity rates to skyrocket. His own Treasury Department reports that legislation that was considered last year by Congress would cause electricity right, right rates right to up, skyrocket. Uh, right on the corners, you got one on the right hand side on the right. Oh. On the right side? Can you right side. Uh, right to say uh, this is really important. Right here, right where you get out. Representatives to do the right thing. Uh, that requires mobilizing uh, a citizen. That requires them understanding what is at stake. You know, and, and climate change is a great example. You know, when I was asked earlier about uh, the issue of coal, plan uh, of a cap and trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Even you know, regardless of what I say about whether coal is good or bad, because I'm capping greenhouse gases, coal power plants, you know, natural gas, you name whatever the plants were, whatever the industry was, they would have to uh, retrofit their operations. That will cost money. They will pass that money on to consumers. That's how it was going to work in Australia. It wouldn't have changed people's patterns. It would have simply put the price of electricity. In fact, everything uh, that you use, you would have put it up in price. And the government then, you know, according to its, its wisdom, would uh, spread the funds across the, uh, the sectors that they do work. Worthy sectors like green energy and companies like Sofitra. We've closed a five hundred and thirty five million dollar loan guarantee for Solyndra. In 2009, the Obama administration gave Solyndra a $535 million taxpayer funded loan guarantee. Stay forward or ahead to I-737 The White House monitored the loan closely and pressured officials to hastily finish a financial review. The why Solyndra? A key Solyndra investor was also a major Obama campaign donor. The true engine of economic growth will always be companies like Solyndra. Solyndra officials visited the White House at least 20 times. It's so important we, we, we invest in Solyndra. Invest what Solyndra is doing. And Solyndra benefited from a lower interest rate than other companies received. It's happening right now. The future is here. At Solyndra's sprawling complex in Fremont, workers in white jumpsuits.
jobs won't be exported. And taxpayers could lose nearly half a billion dollars. So Linda, so bankrupt.